Tonight, a conversation with newsroom decision makers. The Capitol attack. Guilty. Not guilty. Guilty. A racial reckoning. You mask your child, you're a child abuser. That's my choice. That's my choice. You better respect my choice. An ongoing pandemic. First inflation, and then gas prices, and then shipping. And rising inflation. 2021 was a historic year that further divided the nation and tested those managing newsrooms across the country. Coming up on a special edition of Washington Week, leaders from some of the top news organizations discuss writing a first draft of history for a fractured nation. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by the estate of Arnold Adams. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves. Robert and Susan Rosenbaum. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, moderator Yamish Alcindor. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. Tonight, we have a special New Year's Eve edition of the program. We will discuss the biggest stories of the year with some of the nation's top newsroom leaders. These are the folks who decide what you read, watch, and listen to every day. Here to talk about decision making in the newsroom, trust in the media, and lessons learned in recent years are Elizabeth Bumiller, New York Times Assistant Managing Editor and Washington Bureau Chief, David Chalian, Vice President and Political Director at CNN, Julie Pace, Executive Editor and Senior Vice President at the Associated Press, and Terrence Samuel, Managing Editor for News for NPR. And tonight, I want to start, of course, with the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol and the lies about the 2020 election that continue. We're only days away from the anniversary of the attack, and it was, of course, a watershed moment in American history and in journalism. Reporters covered the story in real time, some even in harm's way. And since then, journalists have chronicled the consequences, including the spreading of disinformation about our voting systems. Here's former President Trump in October, after numerous investigations and audits found no significant evidence of election fraud. First of all, he didn't get elected. Okay, forget that. I never conceded. Never. Never conceded. No reason to concede. David, I want to start with you. This January 6th attack, of course, was a TV story. People watched it live play out our Capitol under attack. What was the conversation inside CNN, and what was really the goal of coverage both on that day, but also how has it evolved when we think about all the things that have happened since then? Yeah, Mish, it, it's amazing to think back to that day nearly a year ago because you'll recall that morning started with us still covering the results coming in of the Georgia Senate runoff elections. We had not yet uh, projected uh, both races. I believe in the morning we had only projected one of the two Senate races. So we were waiting for the rest of the votes to come in, figure out uh, which party was going to control uh, the United States Senate. Um, and, and then, of course, as the electoral college count process uh, was getting underway, the insurrection began and we saw this attack on the very citadel of our democracy. And it just, it, it sort of bookended a day that was about the, how the day started with vote counting and vote reporting legitimately, and then ends in the absolute worst case scenario of the lies about the 2020 election and what it can bring. And, and so we have dedicated at CNN, and I know all of my colleagues on this panel and across uh, the media landscape, unbelievable resources to following this story. I don't think there is a bigger story of our time than our democracy being in real peril. And so when we are thinking about uh, not only our coverage in 2021, but looking ahead to 2022, it's not just sort of like, oh, the midterm election year, and we're going to start covering, uh, you know, the president's impact on down ballot races and all of that. that. That'll certainly get covered. But there's going to be a whole separate sort of beat unto itself in our 2022 political coverage, and that is going to be 
following what is happening in the states about uh, restrictive voting rights laws, uh, what is happening with the January 6th Committee on the Hill, and how we ensure that the small d democratic institutions continue to hold in this country. And I, I don't know if there's a bigger story than that in the coming year. Yeah, and, and Elizabeth David talking about sort of really giving resources to this story. Talk about what, what the New York Times is doing to cover this story, especially when you think about the fact that there are lawmakers calling January 6th a tourist visit. Right. We are closely covering the January 6th committee. We are also covering what's happening in the country, uh, in the states. The National Desk is extremely busy with that. And uh, we are also covering Trumpism. Uh, we have we cut way back, obviously, in our coverage of Trump uh, in, 20, uh, in 2021. But right now, we're going to have to beef up, beef up our coverage because of his continuing hold on the Republican Party, on his supporters, and on, on the nation. Uh, it's, it's tough coverage. It's, we're not covering every utterance of uh, that he's, uh, everything he says, obviously, but we are covering the effects of his presidency and his fundraising, um, the investigations into him. And so we'll be, you know, stepping that up in 2022. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree with David. It's a huge story. I also think COVID is a huge story in 2022, as we have seen um, in the last couple of weeks here. Well, we're definitely going to get this COVID for sure. Uh, Julie, I want to come to you. You've also said that, that January 6th is sort of the biggest story of, of, of the year, possibly maybe of, of our lifetimes in terms of, of the, 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 the status of American democracy. Talk about that and how it's informing how the AP is covering this. Well, I think what we have seen over the past several months is that there's what happened on January 6th, and then there is all of the fallout. And this, in many ways, I, I think one of the most important pieces of this, beyond just the attacks on our democratic systems is the spread of misinformation and seeing how fast that misinformation spreads both through technological platforms but also through elected officials and so i think one of our real responsibilities over this past year and this will extend well into 2022 is to make sure that we are correcting the record and that we're doing so in a sober way that we're doing so uh with the facts at the forefront that we're doing it every time we tell a version of this story about january 6th that we make sure that people are armed with accurate information. I think that we have a real responsibility uh, to not backslide on this because we have seen that, again, when you have powerful forces amplified by technology, that misinformation can speed well past the facts. And so it's really incumbent on us uh, at the AP and all of these other uh, newsrooms represented here, I think, to really make this our mission going forward. Yeah, and Terrence, when I think about uh, NPR, it's it's so much about context. Obviously, you cover breaking news there, but you also sort of really do do deep dive investigative reporting. Can you talk a little bit about how you're deciding what to cover, what to call a lie, what not to call a lie, especially going into 2022? Yeah, you know, that was a big debate uh, a couple of years ago uh, with uh, former President Trump. And, you know, I, I it's interesting to hear January 6th framed as this pivotal moment that uh, that kind of set off uh, a, a bunch of implications that we're now dealing with. In some ways, it 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 to look back on it, it it almost seems like it was kind of the the logical conclusion to to a world we had been living in, where misinformation had become um, this kind of like stalking horse to everything we did. Um, the, you know, the the president would say things, and we would debate whether it was a lie or not, um, and. At the end of the day, you know, the we had we had gotten so used to covering the institution of the presidency uh, alongside kind of the distortions of whoever manages to sit in it at the at the moment, and suddenly with uh, President Trump, um, we we couldn't figure out how to separate the those distortions, and, and you know, people adjusted to the office, and suddenly the the office was being contorted to the president, and um, he was. I mean, the big lie being kind of the the obvious, the obvious thing yeah. that uh, that diminishes this. But at yeah. the end of the day, the uh, January sixth seemed like the obvious thing. Yeah, and David, really quickly, because we want to turn to COVID. How is CNN um, dealing with polling? I, it's been such a problematic sort of part of our society. People, in some ways, not believing in polling. Pollsters saying maybe we've got it wrong. If you could really quickly, because we're going to turn to COVID, talk about polling. Uh, sure. Obviously, after 2016 and again after 2020, uh, any organization that does uh, polling had to uh, examine uh, what is it that uh, is being potentially missed in polls. And, and we did that as well. And we have adjusted uh, both after 16 and 20. 
uh, our methodology and our approach uh, to make sure that we are getting as representative a sample as possible. It, it is clear uh, that uh, some Trump supporters are not participating uh, in, especially in media polls, but, but in polling generally and are underrepresented in what we saw in a lot of the public and private polling, by the way. Uh, a lot of the campaign polling on both sides in 2020 uh, was off the mark as well. So yeah. it's just a matter of going back, uh, jiggering our methodology to ensure that we are getting as representative uh, a sample as we possibly can. And it's just going to be an ongoing effort. I, 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 do, I will say, Yamish, Polls overall still work. They do give you a snapshot. But l like anything, I would just urge folks, as you're reading about polls and looking at polls, don't rely on any one single poll. Look yeah. at the totality of the polling that's out there and step back and look beyond that instant snapshot and the overall trends. That's where polling is, yeah. is most helpful in storytelling. Yeah. And I want to now, of course, turn to what Elizabeth brought up, which is COVID. This year began with mass distribution of COVID vaccines. President Biden said July 4th would mark some independence from the virus and a return to some normalcy. But unfortunately, the U.S. and world have been fighting COVID spikes and waves of new variants and political fights over the pandemic and vaccines have intensified. Julie, I want to come to you. What sort of challenges has your newsroom faced when you think about sort of covering this unending pandemic? And how has that really affected assignments? How do you put reporters in harm's way in some ways when you think about sending people into hospitals to tell stories? Well, it's remarkable that we're actually having that same conversation right now, exactly what you mentioned, Yamish, about uh, safety on assignments, about sending people into hospitals or, or to other events, because we thought we would be beyond that at this point because uh, of vaccinations. And really, this has been this kind of up and down year, you know, the highs of the vaccines being rolled out, that feeling like cases were coming down in the U.S., uh, that feeling like we were moving beyond this. And we were having a lot of discussions about what post-pandemic coverage would look like? You know, where would we be focusing on on, on life after the pandemic uh, with an, a recognition that this was always a story that was going to have inequalities? And so we were looking at sort of one type of storyline, maybe in the U.S. and Western Europe, and a different storyline in other parts of the world where vaccine access had lagged. And now, uh, as we reach the end of this year, you know, we're in a situation where the pandemic is in full force. It's different still. Again, the vaccines are safe and they are effective and they are keeping people from being hospitalized. Uh, at the same rates that we saw before the vaccines. But I think that that feeling within the newsroom, like we keep looking to turn the corner, we keep looking uh, to, 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 to shift our coverage beyond the pandemic. I think the reality is this is a storyline that will twist and turn a few more times, but it is one we're going to live with for quite some time. And Elizabeth, talking about twisting and turning, um, you have had the situation where reporters have really had to become, in some ways, experts on science and then had to really try to explain that evolving science to readers. How have you approached that? How hard has that been at The New York Times? You've done a great job at doing it, but it's, it's clearly a challenge. Well, our COVID coverage has really encompassed every part of the newsroom, you know, from the national desk to Washington covering the, the Biden administration response to international covering it all over the world to, you know, we've been, our virus briefing has been running uh, for endlessly now, uh, nonstop, uh, you know, to, to, to the science desk, which has done astonishing work, uh, to the business desk. It's just, it's been uh, basically every part of the newsroom. And it's the the challenge I think now in this in this latest twist, which is the, the you know the huge spike in cases, is to cover it accurately, to cover what's happening, to cover the the you know the astonishing new caseload, but also to point out we're in a different place than we were a year ago. The vaccines generally work. You know, uh, most people, uh, uh, if there's the breakthrough cases, are not going to get a serious case. So we're trying to balance that out so it's not hysterical coverage. But I can tell you, uh, readers are extremely interested. And, you know, they were, it was one of our big drivers um, in 2020. It was one of the, it, people really flocked to our coverage. And it's happening again, unfortunately, um, for, you know, it's not unfortunately for, anyway, it's happening again. Um, that people are, again, flocking to the coverage. Yeah, people are definitely flocking to the coverage. And Terrence, I want to come to you with, it, with this question. The Pew Research Center um, found that just 58% of Americans trust national news organizations. That's down from 76% in 2016. Do you think our industry should be trying to win back that trust? Or do you think that newsrooms should just be doing their jobs, reporting, being accurate, and not worrying about sort of whether or not people trust us? I should say that a lot of this is driven by Republicans in particular, not trust 
pressing national news organizations. Yeah, I, I mean, clearly we should be trying to, to gain the trust of, of the people we, we aim to serve. But I think what you see here is, uh, as, as with COVID, we have become part of the story that we cover. And so I think that, that polling number that you use is kind of a reflection of the political climate of the country. And um, it, it has a lot less to do with what we actually produce in terms of uh, news for, for our audiences. Look, I think you know, COVID was the, the perfect example of why we exist. Uh, there was a lot of news. It was, it was new. It, we were literally figuring it out as it happened, as were the, the, the public health officials who were doing it. Um, there, there was never a, a more crucial moment for, for us to be doing this. At the same time, we were dealing with these huge information, misinformation, fuselage from all over the place. And as a result, this story is now two stories. There's a story about kind of a, a medical pandemic and kind of a political divide in the country that uh, is kind of overlaid on this and causing a lot of problems, obviously. Yeah, that's a smart way to put it. Definitely two stories, the political angle and the medical angle. Um, I also want to say that the relationship between the press and the president can often be tense. President Biden and White House aides have been critical of how the media has covered issues like the vaccine rollout and also his, his withdrawal from Afghanistan. David, what do you make of um, some who say that, the, that, the, that President Biden hasn't been covered fairly, that he hasn't gotten credit for what he's been doing, but also there are some who say maybe we, we should be or the news media isn't holding President Biden to the same standard as, pre as President Bi as President former President Trump rather. First of all, I'm still waiting to meet an administration or a president who thinks they get good uh, press coverage. I don't, Me too. I don't think you hear that uh, all that often. Uh, our job remains the same, and in in one aspect, it may be uh, a, a bit easier than it was during the Trump administration uh, because of the deliberate misinformation and lying that was uh, occurring, but. Our job and mission remains the same, which is that we have to hold those in positions of power accountable, accountable to their words and their promises to the American people, accountable for their actions. And we need to continue to press on that, and we do. And I don't think we have uh, to spend much time being concerned about whether the administration thinks uh, the coverage is fair or not. I think we have to be concerned with uh, letting the facts in our reporting lead the way to ensure fair, contextualized uh, coverage. And, and I think that that is happening. I think it may look um, uh, less combative, perhaps, than people saw between the Trump administration and the press, because uh, it's not a uh, agreed upon, decided upon political strategy from this president and this administration to make the press uh, a political target and an enemy, which, of course, resulted in the distrust you were just talking to Terrence about. But this this whole notion uh, of Donald Trump making the press a political foil, I think that is what has uh, disappeared with the disappearance of Trump from the White House. Elizabeth, what's your take, um, especially as Republicans are saying President Biden isn't getting the same level of scrutiny as former President Trump? Well, and, you know, this is one of those that um, it, I agree with David. But there is no, I don't know of any White House uh, Republican or Democrat that has uh, liked their press coverage from the New York Times and I guess for the, from the rest of us. And I think that, uh, you know, we get criticism that we're too tough on Biden. We get criticism that we're uh, not tough enough on him. But I think we've, and the White House complains every day about our coverage almost. So I, I just think this is the way it is. And I think our coverage of Biden has been quite tough I, to, to answer Republicans. Uh, we have, in the beginning, we questioned, you know, um, uh, the the ups and downs of their of their of their COVID policy, we you know have covered his his premature declaration of the uh, of the pandemic being over this past summer. We have covered the um, the setbacks setback after setback of his legislation on the Hill. We were very tough on the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan and the chaos. So I. Uh, I don't buy it from Republicans. I and I, I uh, that we are too easy on on the, this White House and the, all of us on this all of us in this program know that this has gone on forever. Um, that White House has complained about our coverage, and the next White House says you're being too easy on these guys.
Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something. And I think both of you are making good points about just how combative um, things are. Less combative, but we're still, of course, our job is to hold presidents accountable. I also want to talk about the racial reckoning, of course, that began after the murder of George Floyd in the summer of 2020. It's continued this year. There were intense battles over the consequences of slavery and how the U.S. teaches its history. There's no doubt race will continue to be a central issue to cover next year. Terrence, I want to come to you because there are few, few people of color, black men in particular, who are newsroom leaders. Um, talk a little bit about what you think about the state of diversity in newsrooms and how should organizations focus on hiring but also promoting people of color in their newsrooms? Yeah, I think you saw, as, a, as, a, as I mentioned with COVID and covering the president, we became a part of a very big story. Um, you know, the, the racial reckoning became a story about who tells these stories and are newsrooms equipped to do it? And, you know, obviously the short answer is not nearly close enough. Um, the good thing I think, though, was that it has become such an unavoidable topic and we are in some ways, I think, doing a much better job than we had been and much better job than speaking specifically about NPR than a lot of people are in trying to, to have this conversation. It is kind of the, the, the fundamental American conversation. And for a long time, we were avoiding it. We talk about misinformation, years and years of misinformation. And I think, you know, we finally have uh, in, in some cases, a whole generation of, of reporters in newsrooms demanding that we do things differently. And um, I think for newsrooms uh, like mine, it's, uh, it's, it continues to be a struggle, but um, I think a good one. Yeah, a good struggle is a good way to put it. Um, Julie, how has the racial reckoning affected the way that your organization has th thought about covering race, not only just police killings, but I'm also thinking of housing, of health, of the economy as we see inflation rising. And how does that also impact sort of the, the assignments that you make, the reporters that you choose to cover stories? Well, I think you touch on something really important here. You know, there is coverage of race around uh, what we saw in terms of protests in the streets uh, after George Floyd's death or uh, coverage of police killings. But what we've tried to do at AP is really try to look for uh, what is the discussion of race in any subject area? What is it vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pandemic or education or housing uh, or economics? And I think that that is a, a really positive change in the discussion that we're having. You know, any issue that we are talking about in this country, there's a racial component to it. There's an inequality component to it. And we've really tried to put that at the forefront of the coverage and it's sparked some really fascinating conversations. Uh, I think some really important stories and really crucially, it has also lifted up new voices within the newsroom. We've really uh, seen uh, particularly younger reporters, really empowered, really trying to push us in leadership uh, to think about these stories in a different way. It's affected the conversations we're having when we are hiring staff. And what I hope and what I think our responsibility is as leaders is to make sure that those changes that we are seeing are sustained, that this is not something that we are doing just because we are still so close to what we saw you know, happening in, these, in this country after the death of George Floyd, that this is a systemic change. It's gonna be difficult and it's gonna take real commitment. Um, but I, I think that the result in terms of our journalism and reaching a broader array of people in this country and around the world, that's really positive and we have to always aim for that goal. Yeah, and we have about a minute left and I'm gonna try to split it between Elizabeth and David because I can't choose which one. So, <laughs> Elizabeth, you're, the New York Times, of course, the 1619 Project, you got so much flack from your newsroom, um, had to push back on political falsehoods. How has the conversation been in your newsroom, especially in DC, which isn't connected in some ways to the 1619 Project, but is, is dealing with the consequences? Uh, well, I would say, um, I just would say that covering race uh, at the New York Times is a shared responsibility. So I'm going to bounce off a little bit with what Julie said. Um, you know, it's not, we cover it as a topic, but it's also, again, a part of everything we do, uh, for, again, from the White House to healthcare to all those issues that Julie talked about. And I think that most reporters at the Times need to have a basic expertise in civil rights history and how this is important to us. So I would say that, um, 
we weren't completely affected by the 1619 project in Washington, but um, we are a big part of the coverage of, of Brace at the New York Times. Um, from, you know, we cover the government and that is a huge issue in all the, you know, throughout yeah. Washington. Yeah. And um, I would just say again, and I, you know, the, uh, certainly our newsroom has become far more diverse right. than it was even five years ago. Yeah, and David, we only have 20 seconds left, but CNN, I know, has a whole racial justice unit. Um, why is that a good thing? Why is it, is it good to separate it? Or do you think that there, there's a problem there, possibly, to, in separating it? You, but yes, we have a race and justice unit that got stood up. But the, the point is, is that it integrates with every issue across the newsroom. So when you hear, as, as Julie was saying, whether it is uh, immigration or the economy or education or the pandemic, yeah. Uh, which was one of the prime examples, that race and justice team yeah. plugs into all of those coverage areas, yeah. making sure that it's front and center in our story. Well, thank you so much, David. I appreciate you explaining that. That's it for tonight. Thank you to Elizabeth, David, Julie, and Terrence for joining us. Tonight, there's no Washington Week Extra, but it will be back next week. Thank you for making Washington Week a part of your Friday nights this year. Have a happy, happy new year. I'm Yami Shell Sendor. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by... The Estate of Arnold Adams. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. You're watching PBS.